folks. Why Would You Ask That is a podcast that answers some of the weirdest questions. A lot of those are inappropriate for some listeners. If you're squeamish, easily disturbed, or just having a bad day, this may not be for you. But if you've got to know the answers like we do, stay tuned. Why would you ask that? Presented by me, M, they, them, and Karen, she, her, and Remy, he, they. Today, we're going to talk about Hanukkah. 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 You got to put that phlegm in there. Get it in. Really? I'm not using phlegm. I'm using my tongue. Hanukkah. 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 Yeah, you got it. Hanukkah. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, we're trying not to talk about Christmas right off the bat. Now that we're entering the winter holiday season, I was raised in a Christian household. Even if I'm not Christian, I was I was partly raised in like this weird blended evangelical fundamentalist, but also agnostic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's it's part of what growing up in Virginia is all about. <laughs> Fortunate, yeah. I mean uh, the. The fortunate thing about where I'm from and where you're from a little bit is is we had a very uh, diverse population. So I feel like even if we didn't understand Hanukkah, we didn't learn a whole lot about it. We knew people who were Jewish. Yeah, there were some people. Most of what I know comes from Rugrats. Yes, yes. A lot of what I know comes from Rugrats or like little holiday specials where they talk about the different holidays that are celebrated during this time of year you know back when people were like hey it's the 90s and we're trying to celebrate uh religious diversity and then you know (laughs) (laughs) then the war on christmas yeah then everyone decided that that was a war on christmas and we're like wait hold on we talk about christmas though (laughs) but okay sure so since uh santa stopped jerking off on the starbucks cups you know <laughs> things have been different why so, would you ask that <laughs> why, why would why would you say that so remy, because this is me go on remy tell us something about hanukkah because you am, am i am i being mean by saying it like that because that's the way that it that i've heard it said or should i just say hanukkah i don't think you're being mean but i did see on a couple of forums on Reddit <laughs> that were like in the Jewish part of Reddit where people were like, I, where people were making fun of non-Jewish people for saying it that way. Uh, oh. Like, uh, like whenever, uh, you know, dads go to Mexican restaurants and they say, Ola, <laughs> the oh, waitress gosh. is like, there's like a whole TikTok. <laughs> about well there's many tiktoks where it's just like can i get the frijoles oh my god <laughs> <laughs> i sent it i sent one to my dad my dad's white passing and i'm just like this creature that emerged from the mud not knowing anything about any of my cultures but at least i know that frijoles <laughs> can i get some whack-a-mole <laughs> <laughs> So I definitely see it. I I don't want to be like mean in like saying it in a way that's like, oh yeah, they say it like that to make fun of us. <laughs> but if it's just something that they make fun of me for, okay. I'm like, I, obviously, I'm not Jewish. So I'll just say Hanukkah. But, you know, I understand that that's not the way that it's supposed to be said. Kind of like how guacamole is not pronounced that way can i have a vagina please (laughs) oh that's terrible (sighs) and um oh can i get that with some extra cuso god i'm i'm sure that there's like a way there's like a linguistic rule that's kind of unspoken an unspoken understanding of this is not the way that it is said in its native tongue but that we pronounce it that way. And if we try to pronounce it in its native tongue, it's weird. Like Sakura and karaoke. Yeah. Yeah. 
there's just certain things that I, I tend not to say in the proper accent. And it's just like, those are, I think, the two biggest defenders. Yeah. But everybody says it. Karaoke. And Sakura. And that, I don't even, like, karaoke? Sakura. Yeah. Like, you know. <laughs> it just sounds weird if we say it the right way. Well, it so... sounds like we're being pretentious. There's a certain, like... yeah pretension when somebody who's not part of a culture says it in the correct way like most people will like be like what are they trying to do yeah who are you trying to impress <laughs> exactly but technically there's nothing there, like there's nothing really wrong with it and in fact they're saying it correctly it's just like you're getting ready for somebody to be an asshole yeah yeah i can't i i have no idea what the linguistic rule remy why what? would you ask? <laughs> this, this is a question for another day. <laughs> but anyway, we're focused on Hanukkah. So yeah, how what what is Hanukkah? How did this come about? Why do they celebrate it? Why don't we celebrate it? <laughs> how come we don't get a fancy candelabra? Yeah. Menorah. I okay. want a menorah. <laughs> I don't want a menorah because that's a lot of fire. I don't even like Christmas trees really. I love fire. Well, I mean, I don't want to just leave it. I don't know the, the whole thing behind the fire. Do you have well, to leave it lit? No. Well, okay. For well, one, they don't leave it lit. <laughs> they light the one candle and then the middle. They light the middle candle, the helper candle, and then they light one candle. And then they then they go out that night. And then the next night, they light the middle candle and then the next two candles. And then they take them out. And then, then the third night, they light the middle candle. And then they use that candle to light three candles. And then they go out. They don't leave them lit. Oh, okay. So no fire danger. Yeah. No, no fire danger. But we don't. Okay. Very simple answer. We don't celebrate Hanukkah because none of us are Jewish. Yes. So there, there's that answer right away. I wanted to. Hey. I wanted to talk about Hanukkah because it begins on the 18th this oh, year. Wow. Yeah, that's its date this year. Happy so Hanukkah. I wanted. Yes, Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> almost. By the time that I put this episode up which will be, well, actually, that'll be this weekend. So this weekend, it'll go up right before the weekend that it is celebrated. So yeah, happy, happy Hot Hanukkah. Damn. Almost. Ha happy ha almost ha Hanukkah. Ha 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 <laughs> can't talk. Happy Hanukkah. There also, we don't celebrate it because the Jewish population has been, the Jewish population has always really been oppressed, like, forever. That's so unfair. I know, but like, I know it's, that's true. It's so sad. Shit just kept happening. Yep. They can't catch a break. No. To any of our Jewish listeners, we love you and we appreciate your culture, even if we don't know everything about it. Just know that if you listen, we love you and we support you. So tell us where, where, what are the beginnings of Hanukkah? Because this isn't something that I ever read about in the Bible, which is, you know, at least the beginning of the Bible is part of the Jewish canon. So it was never there. So tell, tell me all about it. I know the Maccabees and it's got a lot to do with oil and that's about, that's about the extent. Okay. So Hanukkah, we can't practice it because we're not Jewish, but also it's a closed practice. So we, we definitely wouldn't be able to practice it anyway oh oh well yes so i don't i feel like around this time of year the poor jewish people only ever get their one little shelf in like walmart and such and it's stupid because on tiktok like i have a lot of jewish creators on tiktok that i follow and those those creators like last year i watched a lot of their content where they were just making fun of the stuff that was on those shelves <laughs> because it's apparently all very very wrong and mm. and silly and not even a very good attempt at being correct Hanukkah merchandise if you were going to make correct Hanukkah merchandise. And then I feel bad because nobody ever talks about Hanukkah or pays any attention to it whatsoever, even though it always falls before Christmas <laughs> to some degree or other. So I was like, well, we need to talk about it. <laughs> so before I address any of the other holidays of any degree or Christmas or the solstice. 
Start and also, with Hanukkah. Start with Hanukkah. Uh, next, we'll talk about some other things that aren't even really holidays. Like, uh, I'll talk about like Krampusnacht, which we just passed, which isn't really a holiday, but it's a cultural observance. Oh, I know Krampus. He's hot, isn't he? Wait. The ESM king. <laughs> that was on the 5th. So we'll talk about it later as just a thing that happens in December because it's not like a like an important anything. It's just sort of a fun thing. <laughs> not fun for the people that he terrorizes, but... <laughs> <laughs> I saw the image of a female uh, Krampus with men who were like, very delighted. <laughs> just <No>. saying. <laughs> so I grew up in Arkansas for the most part. Y'all were talking about growing up up in Virginia, and I grew up down here in Arkansas, and so I had virtually no exposure to Jewish people in the least, because it's the South, and there's just not a lot of them down here, Or and if they are, I didn't ever meet any of them openly, I guess. It's sadly not a very safe area to be culturally diverse in. If you're a Southern person, you're, you gotta be a Christian, right? And if you're a Christian, you hate Jewish people, because for some reason, they believe the Jewish people were the ones who killed Jesus, and I'm like, y'all. The city that I live in now, still down here, they recently asked if we could maybe put up some, like, Hanukkah displays around town, because we have a growing Jewish population, and it was met with a lot of backlash from the local community, and that was frustrating, uh, because I'm not Jewish, but it's it's dumb that people are angry to want to put up, to want people to put up like different cultural displays around town because there are people that live here who aren't Christian or secular in nature who want to be able to see things that represent themselves also. And I had Jewish neighbors move in recently, so I've been making a special effort to learn more than I, than I had known previously because I want to be able to wish them like various happy holidays or like whatever whatever I need to be able to wish them because not all of their holidays are happy holidays. So I need to know, I just wanted to be able to know what to say around the various holy days. And to make them feel welcome. That's very neighborly yeah. of you. Yeah, they're very nice people. And I, so I want to, I want to be nice to them also. Better than previous neighbors. <laughs> Better than previous neighbors. My previous <laughs> neighbors weren't nice people. <laughs> These ones are nice. So I'm going, so I'm going like into a very nice place with them. Uh, starting around Rosh Hashanah, <laughs> I started I started um, taking care to, like, leave them cards and things. Sweet. Aww. Yeah, I'm going to make some latkes, maybe. It's a fried food, and they eat fried foods at Hanukkah, so I'm going to make some latkes. I trust myself to know how to make those. Yes. <laughs> uh, but the other things that are, like, more, like, traditional Hanukkah foods that I found are things that I don't think I could make inside of my own house. So it's going to be latkes. Oh, yum. <laughs> so yes nice. so we're going to talk about this i think that most people who are not jewish probably don't know a lot about the history of the holiday because we don't ever hear about it as i've just established um probably the only thing they know if they know anything other than that there are presents and that there's candle lighting they maybe know the stuff about how there was oil that was lit and it lasted for eight days and that's maybe the only thing that they know outside of the presents but there's like a lot more of it than that. And since I am not Jewish, I want to put my sources up at the top so that we know, the people who are listening to me know that I'm not just talking. <laughs> so where I got my information from largely was my Jewish learning, Jewish News Syndicate, and there's a book called The Wonders of America, Reinventing Jewish Culture, 1880 to 1950, by somebody named Jenna Weissman. Josalit, I think is how you say that last name. She's a historian of everyday life specializing in the history and culture of American Jews. Cool. She's at George Washington University. Ah, that's in D.C. Yes. My people. Your people. Okay, so now we go. So the first and second books of Maccabees contain the most detailed accounts of the battles of Judah Maccabee and his brothers for the liberation of Judea from foreign domination. 
and those books include within them the earliest references to the story of Hanukkah and the rededication of the temple, in addition to the famous story of the mother and her seven sons, and those ones are the thing where the Hanukkah story is like, so it's like that's where the Hanukkah story comes from, the oil stuff, and, oh. and all of those stories, though, okay. the books what? of Maccabees are not included in the Tanrock, the Hebrew Bible. Why? I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> so the canonization process of the Hebrew Bible is associated with something called the Council of Jamnia, which happened around 90 CE with somebody named Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai. That guy managed to escape Jerusalem before its destruction and received permission to rebuild a Jewish base in Jamnia. And it was there that the contents of the canon of the Hebrew Bible may have been discussed and formally accepted. So the story of the Maccabees was determined to not be divinely inspired and thus didn't make it into the canon because all the stuff that they put into the canon was stuff that they de deemed to be divinely inspired. Okay. So like the Maccabees are more like a history book story to them? What I read was that there were various reasons why it might not have been considered divinely inspired was that they thought it was maybe written too close to the time, written down too close to the time that the council was convened or had not been written by that time or that they weren't sure that it was true all the way or there's just a lot of different reasons why they weren't sure that it had been included in the canon, but this happened so long ago that they made these decisions that... Nobody knows exactly why. Okay, so one theory is that only books written originally in Hebrew were considered for inclusion in the canon. However, the book of Daniel, which is included in the canon, was written in Aramaic and not in Hebrew. So people are like, well, maybe that's not the reason that it wasn't included. Uh, another reason that they don't, that scholars think that the book of Maccabees weren't included and why it's problematic that they say that maybe it wasn't included was because it wasn't written in Hebrew, other than that other books were not written in Hebrew that were included, was that they think that the first book of Maccabees was written in Hebrew, therefore it wouldn't have even met that criteria in the first place. So there's another theory to explain the omission of the books of Maccabees, is that, uh, and that was the dates, it's assumed, it's, date. it's assumed that the biblical canon was formalized at Jamnia, and there's some speculation, though, that the accepted list of books was in existence before that. So, in other words, perhaps the gathering of rabbis at Jamnia inherited the list of documents and that they just officially recognized it then. And so the books of Maccabees just wasn't on the list. Oh, yeah. All right. I mean, I there's no way to know. No one knows. Yeah. But then this theory, scholars say, is weakened through a comparison with the book of Daniel also, because Daniel is included within the biblical canon, in spite of the fact that most scholars date that book to the time of the Maccabean revolt also. <laughs> Damn, what the hell? So then it's been suggested that the exclusion of the books of the Maccabees can be traced to the political rivalry that existed during the late Second Temple period between these two different groups of people. So there's one group that's a priestly class in charge of the temple, and those people openly rejected the oral interpretations that the other group uh, had. And so the Maccabees were a priestly family, and then the other group was the other group that formed the biblical canon at Jamnia. <laughs> and so it's possible that the exclusion of the books of Maccabees was one of the last, like, it says salvos in the battle between the two groups. But... That's just one of the theories. Who even knows? <laughs> That's wild. Yes. And then the fourth theory is just that maybe it was pragmatism and not politics. The books of Maccabees describe the revolt led by the Maccabean family against the Syrian king Antiochus, and that a couple of centuries later, Jewish scholars found themselves in Jamnia with the temple destroyed and Jerusalem lost. And so their circumstances were the result of their own failed revolt against the Romans. And so that perhaps they just felt it was not wise to put a book that promoted rebellion into their canon at that time. Mm. So those are the theories. But nobody who studies these things knows for certain. But they still celebrate it. The books that were not included in the canon are, from what I understand, still collected 
into a chunk of books that are just called the apocryphal books. And so they're not like lost and hidden. They're just, they're just elsewhere. They're just not in the Bible. <laughs> so you can yeah. still study them. They're just not included in the canon. Yeah. The Christian Bible has books like that. Yes. They are called the Apocrypha. <laughs> yes. So now, now we slide back into history outside of, outside of just talking about the canon. So after Alexander the Great came and went from Jerusalem, relations between the Jews and the Greeks were so good that an exchange of cultures took place. And according to the Jewish News Syndicate, quote, the Jewish aristocracy had increasingly become enamored, enamored sorry, <laughs> with Greek culture, with its emphasis on physical beauty, sport, different dress, and a worldview at odds with that of traditional Judaism, end quote. So thanks to their wealth and influence, they succeeded in securing the permission of Antiochus, the Greek ruler of the Levant, 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 Levant? Tell me how to say it. <laughs> I've just found that if I don't know how to say something, one of you will know. Levant. We'll go with that. Okay, so thanks to their wealth and influence, they succeeded in securing the permission of Antiochus and building a gymnasium in Jerusalem. Their sub this subsequently became the wedge for the attempt to attack and supplant traditional Jewish practice, such as the temple ritual study and commandments. And what began as a small undertow of assimilation, such as giving children Greek names and speaking the Greek language, became a powerful push to completely assimilate into Greek culture. So Jews who embraced Greek culture at the expense of Judaism became known as Hellenists. Estimates are that a third or more of the Jewish population was Hellenist and would eat pork, bow to Greek gods, and side with the Greeks against their non-assimilated Jewish kin. That sucks. So at the beginning of the year 190 BCE, the situation between the two deteriorated really badly. So Judea came under the control of Antiochus III, who had allowed the Jews who lived there to continue practicing their religion. But then his son, Antiochus IV, was, was less benevolent. So sources from that time recount that he outlawed the Jewish religion and ordered the Jews to worship Greek gods. In 168 BCE, his soldiers descended upon Jerusalem, massacred thousands of people, and desecrated the city's holy second temple by erecting an altar, altar to Zeus and sacrificing pigs within its walls. And then soldiers were sent out to enforce the new laws. So then the Syrian, sol the Syrian soldiers reached somewhere called Modin, and they demanded that the local leader, Mattathias, the Co Cohen, looks like Cohen, and I know now it's Cohen, but a member of the priestly class be an example to his people by sacrificing a pig on their little portable altar. And that guy, the elder um, Mattathias, refused and killed not only that guy, the soldier, who stepped up in front of him and asked him to sacrifice a pig, but also every, like everybody else who was there to do the king's bidding. He was like, no, I'm not going to be doing that. And instead just killed everybody else. Dang. Nah, fuck that noise. Yes. Uh, so then with this rallying cry of, whoever is for God, follow me. Mattathias and his five sons, that's Jonathan, Simon, Judah, Eliezer, and Johanan, they fled to the hills and caves of the wooded Judean wilderness, joined by a ragtag army of farmers dedicated to the laws of Moses, armed only with spears, bows, and arrows, and rocks. The Maccabees, as Mattathias' sons, particularly Judah, came to be known. They fought a guerrilla war against the well-trained, well-equipped, and seemingly endless horses of the Syrian army. Damn, bro. And I also saw that Judah was called Judah the Hammer. I have nothing More else to say Mordecai. about that. <laughs> wow. Well, I, I wish I had a way to look this up and verify, just so that I could. Just so that I could know. <laughs> I can't. There's, there's like an. <laughs> I looked up why, why he was called Judah the Hammer, and there's like a, like a really crazy like comic book <laughs> about him <gasps> apparently. Oh hell yeah! That includes Love him basically that. being drawn like Thor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's rad. I've seen that shit done for Jesus. Oh, <laughs> that makes me laugh. <sighs> Religious figures. Oh my god, he's got the Star of David on him. Yeah. This is... Wow. 
terrible character design. <laughs> but and like I mean, like a mesh shirt with the Star of David on it. Is this what the kids mean? Woof, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? In this comic book, he's six foot five. <laughs> It doesn't seem right for somebody who was born when this guy would have been born. Unless you were Goliath. Six foot five would have been Goliath. Yeah. Or the hammer. <laughs> or Judah. The hammer. He had to be so tall to accommodate his wicked long dingus. <laughs> That's why he's got the loincloth going there, eh? <laughs> they've got him also. They were fighting the Greeks, but they've got him in like Greek slash Roman style armor. I'm. This is just... They don't know. They're not sure. Gotta confuse this, the enemy, right? This page says powers and abilities. Krav Maga. <laughs> Krav Maga! <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> Krav Maga is his power. That's a power. That's not his... That's not a power. That's a martial art. But It's okay. an ability. <laughs> Judah exhibits maximum retention. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this is amazing. <laughs> Great. I've never been exposed to the world of religious comic books. <laughs> oh, welcome. It's weird. It's love doing shit. I don't realize how campy it is. And I'm meaning camp in the, the weird, bad way. Not in the fun, gay way. Apparently he really did just carry a hammer, though. <laughs> uh, which is why he was called the hammer, obviously. Not obviously. If he didn't carry a hammer, we would be confused. Yes. Uh, the uh, Britannica Encyclopedia says they also called him Extinguisher. Oh, shit. <laughs> so in three years, the Maccabees cleared the way back to the Temple Mount, which they reclaimed. They cleaned the temple and dismantled the defiled altar and constructed a new one in its place. Three years to the day after Antiochus's rampage, the Maccabees held a dedication Hanukkah, of the temple with proper sacrifice, rekindling of the golden menorah, and eight days of celebration and praise to God. So the most famous part of the story uh, that people who are not Jewish are aware of is the stuff that happened after all of that. So according to the Talmud, one of Judaism's most central texts, Judah Maccabee and the other Jews who took part in the rededication of the second temple witnessed what they believed to be a miracle. Even though there was only enough untainted olive oil to keep the menorah's candles burning for a single day, the flames continued flickering for eight nights, leaving them time to find a fresh supply. This wondrous event inspired the Jewish sages to proclaim a yearly eight-day festival, apparently. So that detail of the story, the oil part, does not appear until 600 years later in writing. Like, it wasn't in the initial s stories. It wasn't written down in the initial Maccabee story. But 600 years later in the Talmud, it was written down as why Hanukkah was observed. Okay. Someone was just like, oh shit, what if we forget? <laughs> as is typically what happens with religious things. Like, oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Did you know? Or they're just like, yeah, this is a story that we've been telling for ages. And then someone's like, has anyone actually written this down? <laughs> and then and they they're go, like, oh, no. They're like, well, where did you hear it from? Well, where did they hear it from? Your grandparents? And they're like, oh, God. Oh, God. How long does this go back? And they're like, mm hmm. Fuck, fine now. Yeah. They're like, well, write it down. And they're like, oh, God. I don't know. <laughs> That's just how I always imagine religion works. That's how it appears to work. I mean, this is probably basically how any oral story ends up being written down. Somebody eventually just goes, we can write now. Somebody write this down. <laughs> Preserve oh, it. Yeah, like with the Jacks. With the yeah, Jacks. With the Jacks. Yes. That's how the Jack stories in, in the Appalachian area got written down. Yes. Because Council <laughs> Harmon told them orally to his people, to his children and cousins and such. And then a and one of them, Ray, said, let's write it down. Write it down somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> write that down <laughs> yeah yeah that is how it happens people just write it down somebody eventually just writes it down yeah so the earliest jewish reference to hanukkah comes like later the jewish historian josephus 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 flavius who was born in 37 to 38 ce mentions a quote festival of lights quote the name by which hanukkah is also known the Code of Jewish Law, the Mishnah, also refers 
references the Hanukkah festival, but it offers no details or descriptions at all in the, oh. it's in the Talmud where the rituals are located. In there, it discusses the lighting of the Hanukkah menorah, which is the Hanukkah. It's different than a normal menorah. That's why it has a different name. Um, a regular menorah has a different number of like little branches on it. And a Hanukkah really? has an extra one. What? Yeah. But all this time. We've all been sitting around here being like, yeah, menorah, menorah. It has a different name. Yeah, I don't think any Jewish person expects you to know that there's a different name. It's one of those situations from what I gathered from one of the Jewish creators that I listened to on TikTok, where it's like a Hanukkah is a type of menorah, but not all menorah are Hanukkah. Oh, damn. Y'all, I know you've had to be nice in order to appease the, the people who are, you know, being shitty to you, but don't be nice to me. Shut me up and say, no, it's a Hanukkah. And then I'll be like, you got it. And I'm going to be like, can you get them an Ikea? <laughs> and they'll give me that look, you know. Then they'll the give look. you that look like, oh, brother. Like we've heard it before. Yeah. <laughs> Never make that joke again in my presence or I'll snap your neck. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was under the porch the whole time. Oh, my God. You always just went, why, why does it smell here? And everybody went, I don't know. I wonder when Em's going to get back from the from getting some cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. This took a turn. <laughs> <laughs> so Hanukkah, I can't, well, no. Shit. Yeah. The, the difference is that the menorah has seven branches on it. Just to say it now. I think I write it later, but I'm talking about it now. The, the menorah that's, that is lit in the Maccabee story and that's lit inside of temples has seven branches on it. That's six with the shamash, the helper candle. And then the Hanukkah have nine branches, eight with the helper candle. And so, so wait, what's the the helper candle? Can you clarify that for me, please? It's the one that's in the middle that's taller than the other ones. Why is it a helper? Because you use it to light the other candles. So you light that one that's in the middle and then you take that little candle out and you use it to light all the other candles. Oh, okay. And so, I, from what I gathered, you are not allowed to light a menorah, like a regular seven-branch menorah, outside of a temple. And oh. so, to get around that, they just add the extra branches to be able to light the other ones for Hanukkah in their own houses. <laughs> like, fuck you, we're gonna celebrate some shit! <laughs> yep. They're like, it's not sacrilege. There's it's extras. <laughs> yeah. There's a distinct not the difference. Same. It's not the same, okay? Yes. So, the Talmud also reports that the festival was instituted the year after the miracle of the oil, but otherwise it takes up very little space in, in there in the Talmud, and really, for much of Jewish history, and according to all the reading that I've done and the creators I've watched, Hanukkah is just a very, very minor holiday, and they think it's weird that we think it's a major holiday. Oh, probably because we, we try to make it a, an equivalent to Christmas. Yeah. yeah, we're like, oh, it's the holiday season. They're like, it's your holiday season. Well, so winter is still the holiday season for Jews. There's like several holidays that happen in winter um, that are big holidays. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are both major holidays, and they both happen in winter. Um, but <gasps> And then there's another really big holiday that happens in February that's also a big major holiday for Jewish people. But Hanukkah is a minor holiday and is not a major holiday. Well, I want to know more oh, about those yeah. holidays now. Well, Rosh Hashanah is the Jewish New Year. Yom Kippur is the holiest day in Judaism. It occurs annually on the 10th of, oh no, Tish Tishrei? The, the first month of the Hebrew calendar. <laughs> Primarily centered on atonement and repentance. Consists of full fasting and uh, accompanied, accompanied by intensive prayer as well as sin confessions. Yom Kippur is the one where they blow the ram's horn. There's a yeah. ram's horn involved? Yes. Yeah. In the picture. No. <laughs> and you don't don't wish anybody a happy Yom Kippur because it's not a happy day. Oh. I saw a whole bunch of people <laughs> making fun of uh, non-Jewish people for saying, like rolling their eyes and being like, why can they not just look up how to... How to like wish us a good whatever holiday it is yeah that would be like happy good friday christians would be like 
I I still don't know what that is. It's the day Jesus died. Oh, happy Good Friday, I guess. (laughs) Uh, So it's only been in the modern era where Hanukkah took on more significance, particularly in Israel, whose early fighters found inspiration in the heroism of the Maccabees, and with American Jews, which found Hanukkah an analog to public celebrations of Christmas and was a way to feel less oppression in the U.S. in a time that had a lot more rampant anti-Semitism than now, though there is still a whole bunch of it, unfortunately. Yeah. So now I'll just spend the end portion of the show because I just want to talk about how Christmas has changed what Hanukkah is because American Jews practice Hanukkah differently than the rest of the world. I learned while putting this together. Oh boy. Because a bunch of articles came up that said how how American Judaism has changed Hanukkah. (laughs) or has made Hanukkah worse, or has affected how Hanukkah is practiced. And I was like, well, I gotta talk about this, I guess. Dang. Because apparently there's a difference. (laughs) And so the only reason that all of us view Hanukkah the way that we view it with the eight days of presents and like as being such a major event is because of the way American Jews have been celebrating it since the 1800s. And they celebrate it that way because we equated it with Christmas in the first place. So for millions of Jewish immigrants who came to America at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries, Hanukkah in the New World took on like a ambiguous and conflicted meaning. Hanukkah's proximity on the calendar to Christmas, sometimes, because sometimes it comes like midway into November, but it's sort of around Christmas. It posed a particular challenge By the 1890s, Christmas was firmly established as America's premier season for gift giving. For many Americans of all faiths, consumerism and general feelings of good cheer supplemented, if not replaced, what Christians had taken to be their their religious observances of the day. For Jewish immigrants, feeling pressure to shed their European ways, exchanging gifts with neighbors at Christmas time signaled their adaptation to their new home. Formerly called at establishment in 1897, the Jewish Daily Forward, and it's still a running paper, it's just called The Forward, quoted Jewish Christmas shoppers who, when challenged, asked, quote, who says we haven't Americanized, was their answer to, like, why are you Christmas shopping? The paper said, quote, the purchase of Christmas gifts is the, one of the first things that proves one is no longer a greenhorn, quote. Oh. So historian Jenna Weissman Joslet notes, this is from the book that I quoted at the beginning, The Wonders of America Reinventing Jewish Culture, 1880 to 1950. That was from that book by the historian. She says, some Jewish leaders criticized the tendency of immigrant Jews to accept Christmas as an American consumer ritual, writing in The Menorah, which is another paper slash magazine. In 1890, Rabbi Kaufman Kohler asked, quote, How can the Jew, without losing self-respect, partake in the joy and festive mirth of Christmas? Can he, without self-surrender, without entailing insult and disgrace upon his faith and race, plant the Christmas tree in his household? End quote. And so, but not everybody felt bad about celebrating Christmas. Uh, Encountered to that, in Lady's Home Journal, a different rabbi named Rabbi Emil Hirsch said, quote, synagogal calendar The synagogal calendar provides at the identical season of the year an occasion for as intense a manifestation of joy, end quote. So Jewish homemaker advisor Esther Jane Ruski lamented in 1902 that Christmas's focus on family celebrations, gift giving, decorations, and Santa Claus, quote, gives a zest to life that all the Hanukkah hymns backed by all the Sunday school teaching and half-hearted rabbinic chiding must forever fail to give, end quote. So the Jewish population at the time was conflicted on what to feel about Christmas and what to do about the season. And the population of the, of like the general population of America at the time wasn't making it easy on them because people wanted them to assimilate and to stop acting Jewish and European, which is terrible. God, just why do people care? Why, do, why, why does it bother you that somebody doesn't celebrate the same thing that you do? The hive mind. Or at least it feels very hive mindy. Being part of a a thing means people get ostracized no matter what, and it sucks. I hate people. (laughs) Just keep trying to get better. 
That's kind of the point of the podcast. Yeah. Learn every day. Learn every day. There's always something new. It was not until the late 1920s that Hanukkah, quote, began to come into its own as a Jewish domestic occasion and an exercise in consumption, quote, from the historian Jenna Weissman. Um, Merchandisers to Jews began advertising their wares as ideal Hanukkah gifts. There's a paper called Der Tog, which carried an ad in Yiddish for Hudson Automobiles, which were proclaimed, quote, a Hanukkah present for the entire family, the greatest bargain in the world. Oh, okay. God. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the nature of capitalism. You see a market and you just burrow your way in there like a tapeworm. <laughs> That's Precisely. terrible. That's awful. Gross. What? That's capitalism. I know it is, but that's We terrible. live inside of the tapeworm. We're what the tapeworm poops out. That's gross. I hate that. <laughs> You're welcome. Anyway, here's some ads. <laughs> oh, I can't read Hebrew. No, but you can look at them. You can just look at how many of them there are. Look, bro. A cup. Cup with chestnuts on it. Is that pancakes? Latkes? They're pancakes. Pancakes! Heckers! Cake! Royal baking powder. Here's one that has the English ad right next to it. Crisco recipes for the Jewish housewife. As opposed to the, you know, not Jewish housewife. Yeah. They, uh, they put out a lot. A lot of people put out a lot of advertisements. Uh, so one of those, as you could see, is from Colgate. <laughs> yeah. Colgate's. Yeah the top, uh, promoted toiletries as Hanukkah gifts and fruit purveyors such as Lofts and Barton's candies, marketed chocolates wrapped in gold foil to simulate Hanukkah guilt money. So that's even when that started. That wasn't a thing before and it is a thing now and they don't do that in other places from what I've gathered. Huh. Just a thing here. The United Wild. States is real weird. Yes. Uh, Aunt Jemima Flower proclaimed itself, quote, the best flower for latkes. And the Hadassah newspaper advised that, quote, Mahjong sets make appreciated Hanukkah gifts, end quote. Mahjong sets. Yep. Really? I feel like that's not cool. I, I don't know. I feel like that, huh. It just feels weird, doesn't it? it that feels weird. <laughs> so with the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, Hanukkah took on a like a renewed meaning in the aftermath of the Holocaust, success of Israeli military forces helped rebuild the image of the Jew as a fighter. So we talked like, well, we didn't talk because I didn't do the other episode. Um, Zionism became like a bigger thing, which is the definition of Zionism that I found from a lot of different sources is just a thing where you believe in the Jewish statehood and independence and that not all jews identify themselves as zionists but some do uh i'll just put, i'll just put up an article where people can read about it yeah i don't want to get into that right now no so people who identified as zionists uh identified pre-statehood zionist militias as maccabean descendants adapting the image of martial jews to a Hanukkah product line, Lofts Chocolate Company issued a board game called, quote, Valor Against Oppression, quote, that featured some that featured somebody called General Mosh Dayan. General Mosh Dayan? Yes. Who's that? An Israeli military leader and politician. Ah. Yeah. Oh, he's got an eye patch. <gasps> Whoa, oh. for real? Damn. That's a real dude with a real eye patch. Yeah, he's not bad looking. He was the commander of the Jerusalem Front in the 1948 Arab Israeli War, chief of staff of the Israel Defense Forces from 53 to 58 during the 56 Suez Crisis, but mainly as defense minister during the Six Day War in 1967, and became a worldwide fighting symbol of the new state of Israel. Here we go. I can put up something about him too if you want. Uh, and then another company. Barton's produced what the historian Jenna Weissman-Joslet called, quote, an 
Israelized version of Monopoly, whose board featured a map of Israel, miniature Israeli flags, and menorahs, end quote. In 1951, a California Jewish woman offered advice that, while acknowledging the parallels between Hanukkah and Christmas, bridges the worlds of Jewish particularism and American civic celebration. Quote, let this be our guiding principle, keeping within the framework of our own tradition, using a color scheme of blue and silver and yellow and gold, let us adorn our homes inside and out as beautifully as we can for Hanukkah, enlarging upon the old-time feast of lights. End quote. So, now... Because so many of us non-Jews don't understand what happens during Hanukkah other than candles and presents, we can talk very briefly about traditions now, uh, because now we've talked about why American, uh, the American Jewish population does what it does. Consumerism forced them to celebrate the way they, for they, for they do now. <laughs> but it comes from a rich history of, uh, of, of like fighting oppression. <laughs> So they light their Hanukkah, that menorah that has the nine branches on it, and it was lit only by specially, the original one in the temple in Jerusalem was lit only by specially ritually pure olive oil, and that olive oil took more than a week to prepare, which is why the day where they found that oil and then it lasted for an entire week longer than it was supposed to was so like special and miraculous because they literally could not get any more oil because it took so long to process and find. Damn. Okay. Yes. That's why it was so important. Uh, another tradition is eating fried foods. You know, things cooked in oil. People think of latkes when they think traditional food, but I was reading on a different website, uh, the Washington Post, I think, which is not a Jewish website, but I was reading on there that latkes are not specifically, specifically the food of Hanukkah, but it is a food cooked in oil <laughs> and fried um, but like jelly donuts are also one that was listed over and over and over again. Huh. I can't pronounce the word in, in Hebrew, but jelly donuts. Um, playing dreidel before the Maccabees drove out the Greeks and rededicated the temple. Jews were forbidden from worshiping their God or studying the Torah, but they studied their sacred texts anyway. And to hide what they were doing, they would put away the books in scrolls and take out the little tops and pretend to be playing with them according to my Jewish learning. And so in commemoration today, Jews just play, they still play with the little tops on Hanukkah. The dreidels are marked with four Hebrew letters, which stand for the phrase um, in English, great miracle, a great miracle happened here. Hmm. And what you do with the dreidel is you're gambling your um, little chocolate coins or real coins or really anything that you want to guilt your guilt yeah or anything that you want to really um i don't i don't know how i looked it up once but i don't know how uh and gift giving was not ever a tradition at all traditionally there's another holiday called purim that was the jew that that's the jewish holiday for gift exchange but as christmas and the christmas gift exchange rose to prominence in american culture American Jews have just had just started doing it on Hanukkah, as I talked about. So now people give gifts in the U.S. on Hanukkah. And I was reading on Reddit that all that not even all families in America give gifts on all the nights or give gifts of the equivalent type on all nights. Um, sometimes on all, all eight nights, children will just receive the guilt on all the nights and then on the last night they'll receive presents. Sometimes they'll receive like seven really small presents and then big presents on the last night. I was reading that in one family they said that on each night a different family member is supposed to give a gift so everybody is not giving a gift on every night. Sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Yes. Everybody just comes up with their own thing. The reason and the reason why money is given is that the practice grew out the out of the custom of providing gifts to seminary students and teachers, and that was money initially, in back in like the 17th century in Poland, and now we just still give money. But in America, grandparents might still give actual money, but over here in America, they're doing those little chocolate covered coins that get, that got popular in like the 20s. I said, so that's where we're at now. <laughs> I now mean, we have all learned. It's like, I mean, I'm 
sad that we've kind of forced this holiday to be bigger than maybe it's really supposed to be but you know i don't know i don't know how to feel it's complicated yeah feelings wow now that i know that it's like a minor holiday i'm like oh we're just kind of weird about it yes I know it's right at 10 o'clock, but did you want to hear the story of the Hanukkah heroine that I had pulled up? Why not? Ooh. Oh, it's, um, oh, she's great. Yeah. Tell me the story. For the people who, who don't know, she's, it's the uh, woman who cut off that guy's head. A woman who cut off that guy's head. It yeah. happens a lot in history. Yeah. My favorite picture is this last picture that I sent before the statue. It's by... Artemisia Gentileschi from the 17th century. It's Judith and her maid uh, just savagely cutting this man's head off. <laughs> so the book of Judith, it's considered canonical by Catholics and apocrypha by Protestants and non-canon by Jews. Interesting. It tells the story of the defeat of the Assyrians at the hands of a Jewish, uh, at the hands of a Jewish woman named Judith. <laughs> Hell yeah, go Judith! So here's here's the story. So the Syrians have like surrounded the city Bethulia and cut off their water supply. So the siege is just going on and on and on. And after thirty four days, everybody in the city is just like torn apart, thirsty, bitter. So. A man named Uzziah and the town's other magistrates have just, like, given up. And so they say that they're going to surrender to the Assyrians, but in five days. So they're like, give us five days for the Lord to save us. And in five days, if God has not saved us, then you can just take over and it's fine. We'll give up. Uh, so Judith, who is a widow in the town, she gets really upset about this. And she is like, no, this cannot stand. So instead of going to see the leaders, she is just like, all of you come to my house. <laughs> so they go to see her. And she says, what are you doing? Why are you giving up? And they're like, well, sorry, sorry about it. <laughs> um, if God wants to save us, he'll save us in five days. And maybe you could just pray for rain. <laughs> She's like, that's her. bullshit. <laughs> uh, they, they literally tell her, well, if you want us to be saved from not having any water, you should pray for rain. <laughs> and she's like, no, thank you. <laughs> uh, and she tells them off for not believing in God and enough to think that he's going to do anything. And she was like, it's fine. I have a plan to save our city and Jerusalem and the temple and everything. And they're like, what is it? And she says, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't you like to know would you like to know and she's like meet me at the gate i'm gonna go out with my maid you stay here because you guys obviously suck <laughs> clearly i am telling the story very officially <laughs> but oh, yeah. uh he's great um i don't know a lot of bible stories that are not big bible stories by memory but she's got a good story yeah uh so the leaders are like okay <laughs> they're like they tell her they say, this is not the first time that your wisdom has proven to be true. So, okay. <laughs> They're like, well, we'll let you do whatever it is you're going to do. Uh, so she goes out with her maid. She, so she goes. She prays to God to be a good liar and to be strong is what oh. she prays for. Mm -hmm. And she's not even the first woman in the Bible to pray to be a, to be a good liar. No. Yeah. I'm thinking of the quote-unquote harlot isn't it in the story of is it in the story of jericho it's in one of those times when they were trying to take over a city women are always begging to be good liars for god they're like please help me actually do this and god's like you got it babe well women in the bible didn't really have much of a choice you know yeah they're like I, damn i hope this works <laughs> yeah, they yeah they weren't given many options yeah, Rebecca, she had to pray to be a good liar for the sake of her son. Tamar, Shifra, she she had something to do with Moses. Moses' sister. It's just there's a lot of them. Just have to they just have to. They need to they need to lie good. They need to lie good. So she she goes out. She dresses in her most beautiful clothes. 
because she's like, I'm going to catch all the eyes <laughs> when I leave here. Yeah. I'm going to go out. <laughs> go do this. And she leaves the city. And she specifically says in her book, it says she dresses, quote, to entice the eyes of all the men who might see her, <laughs> quote. They leave at night and go down into the valley um, intending to be captured. So they are stopped by an Assyrian border patrol and escorted by 100 men, it says, directly to the guy who's in charge of the army. And right when she's there, she spins this this tale um, about how she's like directly has access to God and that she's going to guide this guy and his whole army through the hill country to Jerusalem without the loss of any life so much as like even the dogs and in the army and that like she's running away from the city and she's like forsaking all of these all of the city and she's just coming to be with him and he's taken in by her she's gorgeous <laughs> he's like oh yeah <laughs> i mean he took he calls her beautiful and eloquent um he welcomes her into the camp he grants her requests to travel through the camp at night to bathe and um of course he does. Like, he's like, take your clothes off in my camp, of course. <laughs> well, yeah. He's like, ugh, just yes. let me get this over with. So for several days, she's just sort of in the camp, just not not kept track of. She just wanders around in there. He did, Nobody bothers bothers her. Um. So throughout her book in the Bible, uh, Judith, it says literally... Judith merely smiles and men collapse. Judith, and it says Judith, 10, 7, 14, 19, and 23. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. Imagine being that beautiful. Yeah, apparently she's this gorgeous. Uh, I know I've told you to go watch Memoirs of a Geisha before, but this is also in that movie. The whole, <laughs> during her training scene, she's told you have to be beautiful enough that you can, the mere sight of your eyes will cause a man to faint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh and it happens so so she appeals to their senses of sight and smell and just like mesmerizes them her so her weapons of warfare are just her like womanly charms quote quote her sensuality she dresses really carefully knowing the success of this ruse are just dependent upon how much she can entice people uh and so you might People nowadays might call this like bad no. because you get two camps. You get women who are like, ah, oh, this is awful. Her using her body uh, to do this. And the other camps that are like, no, it's <laughs> um, she knows what she has to work with in the time she's working in. So back in the day, you just women just don't get a lot of options for how to do the things they need to do. It's, it's a story of empowerment in a time when, you know, power was hard to come by. So she's, she like, she puts on like a festival dress. She's wearing perfume. She put on like a tiara. She's got rings and bracelets and anklets and earrings and beautiful sandals. And, um, and then she goes to the army commander's tent after like three days. And she just like reclines in there and like eats some little food that she brings. And she <laughs> tells him today is the greatest day of my whole life. Mm. He's like, mine too. <laughs> that's And that's also in quotes. Uh, and then she gets him completely and utterly drunk. <laughs> as drunk as he has ever been. Yes. And then she uses his own sword to cut his head off. There you go. Yeah. You guys, don't your guard down. <laughs> yeah. Then she uh, just sort of kicks his corpse out of the bed onto the floor. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> then she takes the canopy from his bed. <laughs> And to like put his head in, uh, and just leave, just like leaves. Wow. Uh, her and her maid just like, and then they shove it into the food sack so that you can't tell that it's a head. And then she just gives it to her maid, and her maid carries it. And they literally just they literally just walk out of the Assyrian campment. Bye. They've been there for All three the days. Like, yeah, they've been there for three days. They've done nothing wrong in three days, and they're gorgeous. So the men are just like, bye. <laughs> bye. Oh my god. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Dummies. They think that they're going to go bathe, 
because that's the way that they go. And they've been doing this for three days. So they just let them go that direction. But instead of stopping the babe, they just keep on going back to the city. And Never so, mind that bloody sack that she's carrying. Exactly. Uh, and so she, when she gets back to the city, the men of the city that she had told to meet her back at the gates were there. Uh, and so she comes back in the city and she's standing there in front of everybody. And she was just like, yes, so here's this head. And she just takes it out and just shows it to everybody. Uh, and she's just like, by the way, I've, I've killed the guy who's in charge of the whole army um, because I prayed to God and he said, sure. And uh, also, he did not defile me in any way. So you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> that was something you guys were worried about. Yeah. She's like, so... I guess I did what you all couldn't do, and I've won this whole war for us. So there you go. I'm the best. <laughs> there you go. There's Judith. Yeah. And the guys were like, damn. And then they all fainted. The, the man who's in charge of the city, Isaiah, calls her the most high god above all other women on earth. Quote from Judith 1318. Damn straight. <laughs> damn straight. Uh, I love Judith. People don't tell good the, all the good stories of all the all the cool women in the Bible. <laughs> People don't tell them enough. People forget about all the cool women that are in the Bible. We don't get to hear enough of them because everyone's so obsessed with Jesus and what he did. And then they don't even tell the stories right. <sighs> that guy was fucking crazy. <laughs> it's the best part about him, really. Yeah. Like, he was fucking nuts. This is my favorite thing. He's like... What, what what is this capitalism in my church <laughs> and then he took the time to sit there and braid his own whip so that he could beat everybody with it flip yep. some tables <laughs> he's like man fuck this fuck that fuck all of that i'm gonna beat your ass and you're gonna thank me and the pharisees were like oh <sighs> yeah okay so, story of Judith, uh, not just told from my own brain, uh, quotes taken from Jewish Women's Archive, again, because I feel like I need to give a source. I'll put it up <laughs> on the resource page. <laughs> Very good. Nice work. We'd like to wish everybody a happy Hanukkah. Enjoy. But thanks, everybody, for listening. We are very excited to take your questions, too, because... We want to hear them, and we want to answer them, and we are so super qualified to answer questions. So what you can do is you could visit our website, which is whywouldyouaskthat.com, and go to that little contact form, throw in a question, or you could email us at whywouldyouaskthatpod at gmail.com. So please send us your questions. We don't care how weird it is, how gross it is. Just don't ask any personal questions. That's our one line. Ask your weird questions. That's what we want. So thank you for listening. This is M, Karen, and Remy. And ask us some shit. Thank you. Good night.